Red Hat has cooperated with SAP and Sybase for more than a decade on technology products. SAP's certification of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 for SAP applications on-premise or in the cloud highlights another step forward in the partnership. Now, please welcome to the 2012 Red Hat Summit, Irfan Khan, Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer, Sybase, an SAP company. That was a great presentation by Paul. I, I learned a lot. Uh, my opportunity today is uh, to share with you some ideas and also some thoughts from SAP and, and the partnership that we've been evolving with uh, Red Hat over the last decade or so now. One of the first things I want to just highlight is, um, A, I think I feel as if I'm slightly overdressed for the occasion. Uh, you'll have to excuse me. I think from coming from England, undressing or dressing down, I should say, means typically undoing your top button. So uh, perhaps I'll get to that point later on. So uh, let's talk about today, firstly, from a company perspective, SAP, our strategy and how it's been changing over time. And I want to make sure that I get this point across because it's quite an important point. So if we look at SAP as a company, A, it's huge. And I must confess, my own background, I came from Sybase. So Sybase was acquired by SAP uh, in 2008. Uh, the opportunity really that came about was that we wanted to introduce within SAP an extension of what they already do from an uh, on-premise perspective of applications and be able to extend those applications to a much broader audience, an audience which will be able to get to more of an on-device based actual uh, application environment and, of course, from a consumption standpoint. And from an SAP evolutionary standpoint, SAP today, if you think of, you don't necessarily see SAP everywhere, it's not kind of wall-to-wall -wall in terms of most IT organizations, but the impact of SAP is quite tremendous. Today, more than 65% of the world's GDP will touch an SAP backend at some point in time. Quite spectacular, 65% of the world's GDP. By that I mean, if you think of the entire ecosystem of partners, customers that we have, what they produce across 24 industries will have a transaction or a workflow that will be either initiated or transacted within an SAP environment. So it's an amazing set of technologies that SAP has developed over the years. Where SAP is really making an extension now is if we take a look at the evolution of applications from on-premise, going on to on-demand and then on to on-device, we need to do so in a non-disruptive way. So there are two core principles that SAP is abiding by. Principle number one, we want to be non-disruptive to the customer's landscape. It's extremely important. Paul talked about this, the opportunity to bring about change but not radically changing everything overnight because, of course, people have to be able to consume technology. They have to be able to accept the fact that technology comes at a certain cadence, and you can't just change everything overnight. So we believe in this non-disruptive concept. And the second point is, extremely important, is to remain open to customer choice. We don't assume that we're going to cart in a refrigerator-sized box that will have the prefix of EXA on it and assume that everybody's going to be taking that overnight as well. We believe that customers have landscapes today that have to be preserved, and we have to assume that whatever we do has to be consumed by the customers in a non-disruptive way. So if we look at their strategy now, this is another important part of SAP, it started off with this viewpoint where it was very close, very insular, because of the revolution of applications. It just needed to be predictable. So we went from the past position of being very closed we now used to ask, of course, we used to ask the questions, why open source? Is it really going to be secure? Is it going to have all the tendencies that we need to be able to support an enterprise mission-critical environment? And we've gone full circle. So the question now is asked is, why not open source? If we take a look at the, the, the opportunity to con contribute back to the community, we've gone from preserving everything in-house to voluntarily giving it over to the community as well. And thirdly, if we look at this open source concept in terms of not going open source, we actually believe, truly believe in this now being a forerunner, providing innovation opportunities and safeguarding our investments in the future as well. Big turn around in terms of events from an SAP perspective. If we look at the contributions that SAP has made over the last uh, several decades as well now, oh, what we're trying to evolve now to the point is that what we do is becoming more internally used, but that also should be voluntarily given to the community as well. And this hockey stick effect, as you can see, starting tracking from 2007 to where we are today, you can see the incremental number of contributions that SAP is making in areas of Eclipse, in areas of you know, shared developer resources, and I'll talk about that in just a second. 
Now, as far as the, the, com the co opportunity of SAP is concerned, we also have to understand that starting off 40 years ago, SAP actually celebrated its 40th anniversary this year. What we wanted to try to achieve was becoming much more open for the developer community. One way of doing that was to go away from this historical black box approach of SAP, where you have BAPIs and RFCs and very cryptic and at the same time somewhat cryptic, I should, shouldn't say call it cryptic, somewhat, somewhat insular uh, APIs that were being used by a very large ecosystem. The opportunity was that how do we extend this the, uh, the ecosystem to developers, JBoss in particular, so that you can start developing mobile applications and have a very simplified experience. And the way that we've achieved that is through NetWeaver Gateway. And what Gateway represents for SAP is a consumption platform that enables various classes of applications, whether it's web-based applications, mobile applications, whether it's rich clients, whether it's thin clients, all achieved through a common, consistent application transparency format so that variety of applications can be developed. And through this alliance now with Red Hat, through the JBoss effective from middleware, what we're able to do is you can start consuming RESTful web services and allow those development of applications to be made much, much more simplified from an SAP perspective. SAP, as I said, has a system of record which spans many, many industries. And now with the advent of this JBoss extension that we have through NetWeaver Gateway, it entitles developers to consume application data in a very consistent and a very transparent way, making it much, much easier for new development. So I said a bit about the, the overall sort of history of SAP, 40 years old, it's been innovating in applications for many decades, trending now towards more open source, becoming much more of a contributor to the open source community. Just a word or two about the Red Hat alliance that we have. Red Hat, both for Sybase, which is a business that I came from, over 20 years ago I joined Sybase. It was 93, 1993 when SAP, or rather Red Hat, was first established. And what we've seen in that 20 years is a tremendous contribution to the industry. I would call it a pioneer. It's by far one of the most interesting companies that I've been tracking for many years now. And it also provides me with a great deal of warmth because Red Hat, for an SAP and from a Sybase perspective, is a pivotal partner. From a Sybase perspective, we actually do all of our development on Red Hat. If we think of the de development environment that our developers use, our engineers use, they use Red Hat. It's a very important part of our ecosystem from a development standpoint. If we take a look at SAP's investments in the Ecolab, what we wanted to do was to have a mechanism where if we start developing mission-critical enterprise-grade applications, it should be done so in a consistent way. So Red Hat was a pioneer behind the Linux lab that we set up, where we have Red Hat representative uh, employees actually on site, on premise, in Waldorf in Germany, where they work with our teams to be able to ensure that we have a very consistent development platform and ensure that we produce software and applications in the most consistent way as well, in the most efficient way. So we have a very deep-rooted partnership with, it, with Red Hat, from both from a Sybase perspective historically and also from an SAP perspective. And we believe that this partnership will go even stronger now, particularly since alliances are forming within the industry at large, which I'll, I'll comment on. So I said a little about the company. Let's talk about our technology direction and really what the focus is from an SAP standpoint. And I want to share with you some insights. I'll start also making some assertions. And the assertions that I'll make is as follows. If we take a look at the evolution of applications, packaged, custom, or even from an ISV perspective, a large number of the systems of record have already been established. If you think about this, many, many accounting systems, payroll systems, whether it was uh, sales and distribution systems, have been established. What we need to do is to be able to extend those systems now to much more uh, pervasive endpoints, like the mobile community, like the community that needs to have information on demand. The reality is that in order for us to do that, we have to start thinking about different dynamics. We need to increase the ability to start consuming and, and applying real-time information to our decision-making process. We also need to take a look at how do we become much more predictive. We don't want to just look at the information in the current situ point in time. We want to take a look at it from an evolutionary point in time and also looking at future outcomes as well. That's another important characteristic we need to take a look at. And also this mobile computing productivity. If we really look at the net IT spend, the CIO spends today, he's not spending the discretionary spend that's available. They're not just spending on task automation yet more on task automation, they're looking at how they can empower information workers or white collar workers to be able to extend what they already have on premise and being able to take it onto the device, the on-device uh, capabilities that are in most people's hands right now. So to do this, and really planning for the enterprise of the future, we have to start looking at the evolution of IT. Three things that we have to look at. First and foremost, we need to take a look at the deployment models. 
Now, this shouldn't be a religion. We don't want to start talking about SMP versus MPP, or scale up, scale out, or whether it's shared everything, shared nothing. These are the philosophical things that most people jump to or gravitate towards. We need to take a look at this in terms of what would be the most appropriate infrastructure to truly define as we go forward the next generation of applications, having application consistency across all of these different modalities, whether it's on device, whether I said it's on demand, of course, on premise as well. We need to have that level of consistency. If we look at the paradigm shift as well, we want to make sure that both the data and the applications can be consumed in a simplified way. Testament to the fact that we have the SAP's NetWeaver Gateway, just as an example. Another important point is that we have to play to the breadth of the technology stack that's also available. And this implies that we must be much more cognizant about the open source community and what's leverageable directly now and in the future. So let me drill into this in terms of what are the technology factors that we can really start leveraging today. If we look at these dimensions of data center firstly, the data center has become tremendously more enhanced in terms of performance. If we look at many customers like a JP Morgan Chase, a financial services customer of both uh, SAP and of Red Hat, there is a compute backbone within Red Hat, uh, or, sorry, within, within JP Morgan Chase, which comprises some 50,000 processing cores. And they use that for various simulations. They may run Monte Carlo simulations, they may do pre-aggregation pre of data, and then taking a look at it from a risk perspective. But the important point is, that if we look at these data centers, they're becoming much, much more efficient. Intel, with their new E7 architecture, microarchitecture, new chipset brought, that's been brought out, what they've essentially brought out now is much, much more efficiency. Within 130 watts today, they're able to run 10 cores, 20 processing threads, and if you re relate that back to, say, five years ago, you're running, say, two cores in 110 watts. So if you look at the power envelope, the thermal design power that now is used within these modern microprocessors, you're able to do substantially more processing within a substantially smaller power envelope. And that gives you, you know, increasingly more compute cycles to be able to leverage. If we take a look at the evolution of these processors, what we also have now is the ability to start consuming much more memory in these processes as well. So 64-bit addressable memory has given us much more efficiency, and the price point is consistently coming down as well. If we look at the device center, this is another clear example of the pervasiveness of compute now getting to the device. In 2010, Apple introduced the iPad, the first generation of the iPad. In the first year, they sold approximately 15 million units and that contributed $4.6 billion to the bottom line. 17% of the total revenue of Apple was attributed just to the iPad. But the important thing to point out here is that the iPad is yet but one example of a tablet. If we look at the total number of devices that are out there, there's in excess of 4 billion devices that are out there now. And as these devices become much more connected, it implies both from a data consumption point of view and from a data creation point of view, there's gonna be substantially more endpoints that we have to deal with. So that comes into the wide interconnect space. How do we allow all of these different devices to be used? Particularly if we think back when the in innovations took place of the web, we ended up in consuming so much more compute cycles on the back end because we open up the back end to much more users. Well, mobile computing opens up substantially more. If we take a look at the networking capabilities today, there's been evolutions in speed. Remote direct memory access gives us the ability to be able to copy and look at data across different nodes, allowing scale out to be achieved. In fact, Red Hat, in fact, has a strong offering in Red Hat Enterprise, uh, Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux to be able to extend to the point where you can have these advanced networking capabilities, and you can actually do RDMA over converged Ethernet. So there's an extension already available within Red Hat to do this. The opportunity is, is how do we extend this capability, become much more performant? In the wireless networks, we have, as I said, a convergence towards IP networks, whether it's LTE, whether it's going to be WiMAX, whether it's going to be Wi-Fi. The pervasiveness of access is going to be there. And then also in the open technology space, we also have today much more of a demand. I mean, demanding capitals, I'm shouting at you, the demand for, for open APIs and for the ability for that consumption via these protocols that are going to be available so that you can consume information, consume it in a much more of a manageable way. And of course now, the whole notion of all of these different platform offerings, the, the introduction of many of these new individual pieces of technology, whether it's in-memory uh, computing, where you have things like Cassandra and you have things like MongoDB, these are very defined entities that could be used in a very pervasive way. And we have to be much more cognizant about that in today's technology environment and landscape. So I've talked about some of these things in passing. But with all of this innovation, data center, device center, you wider wireless networks, and the technology stack, 
How do we consume this and how do we do it in a non-disruptive way? Well, one thing to point out is that the macro technology trends that we have in front of us are also dictating our mind share. How do we perceive that these technologies or these individual pieces of technology will drive our innovation opportunities? And just assembled here, you have the, probably the top 10 or so massive macro trends that are in the market today. I've highlighted big data just to prove a point. The point I want to prove is that if we take a look at big data, even today, there's massive deluge of information in many IT systems. There's this notion that we always have. I wrote a recent article, and it was published in Forbes, and it was a big lie about big data. And my point really wasn't to act as a contrarian. It was to prove a simple point. What we have in today's IT landscape is many safe safeguards to be able to achieve the level of data support that we need. We've dealt with this over time and memorial. This is not something which is new. But of course, today, big data captures a lot of attention. You Google the term, you'll get up like 1.3 billion hits or something or other on big data. It has its own Wikipedia page. And the reality is that if we look and hear about the commentary in the industry, information Armageddon is upon us. We're going to die with all this deluge of data. I'm not denouncing that. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. But what I am saying is that IT has its way of dealing with this. The way that we deal with it, we have faster processes, all of the innovation that I just talked about. So there is a capacity to be able to consume data. And by consuming data, what we have to understand is that there is huge opportunities in managing data and doing it so efficiently. The enterprises of the future are going to be successful if they manage to allow all of this data to grow uncurtailed, but do so in a way where they can actually manage it with efficiencies. Now, this just gives you some dimensions, and I'm sure many of you had this kind of uh, sermon before about big data, but the reality is just one point I want to raise here. If we look at the evolution of data, the structured data that we've been dealing with, we've actually done a pretty good job at managing structured data. But if you go by Gartner's estimates, we're talking about 650% increase in, in data over the next several years. 80% of that is going to be unstructured data. So around this circumnavigating this, uh, this circle here, you have everything from location-based services, machine data, text data. All of this stuff that's now being generated has to be consumed. And the important thing that we have to do, take a look at is we have to be able to make sense of that information. There was a great Wall Street Journal article uh, around about 2008 when the financial services industry went through meltdown. And the article read something along the lines of, we had all the data, but we had no information or insight. It's quite a telling point. Huge amounts of data, but we couldn't really do anything with it. So really, if we're looking at this and we want to achieve real-time insight, the one thing that we have to understand is we have to get to the point where we understand the dimensions of latency. There's a big problem that we have to understand is that dimensions of latency can be encountered in many different levels. There's some great research that was done by Dr. Richard Hackathorn. And the dimensions that he talked about was that this really on the time continuum of an event occurring and, or, or triggered event occurring and some action being taken, there's three levels of dimensions of latency that we have to deal with. At the first level, you have the data latency. Data latency represents the amount of time it takes you to physically have the raw data persisted in some repository and then allow that information to be stored, perhaps being run through some business rules, data quality issues may need to be concerned, you may need to concern yourself with. So persisting it in a way that you can actually allow that information to be stored in an efficient way. That's one dimension of latency. The second dimension is analysis latency. Let us assume that you've stored the information. You now need to retrieve that information back again, and you need to run through once again any business rules, make sure that it's consistent for consumption, and then you're going to run into this third level of dimension or latency, which is your decision latency. That's the time it physically takes you to generate the alert, deliver the alert to some endpoint, and then act upon that information. So data analysis and decision latency. And on the time continuum between a triggered event and the action being taken, the longer that you incur time and latency, the diminished value of that information and insight becomes. So the goal really is that you want to collapse all three dimensions of latency, have a much shorter time window between an action being taken, and that ultimately will increase the value of that insight. And this really, in, in a nutshell, is what we should be striving towards. If we want to make sense of data and we want information to be harvested for insight, we have to address these latency hotspots. Now, in terms of being able to do this, there's been a variety of technologies that are coming to the market. If we take a look at the classic database model, databases typically are a system of record that you persist data into some store, and then after the data has been stored, you retrieve that information and then you act upon it. You have the innovation now of complex event processing or event processing. 
you have message buses that have been around for quite some time. In fact, from a Red Hat perspective, we've been working quite closely with some of our FSI customers and the uh, Financial Services Industries customers, I should use that acronym and expand it, Financial Services Industries customers, where we have this collaborative work in the messaging space. And AMQP, the Advanced Messaging Queuing Protocol that's being used by many of the banks, Red Hat has been a, a founder and a contributor from, from the very beginning. And I use that example because just as we assume that file systems are great for storing information, you just know they work. And the reality is that we don't make a second guess on retrieving information from a journaled file system, whether it's a synchronous file system or even an asynchronous file system. We just assume it's going to work. The problem is that there's so much infrastructure that is out there that we just assume that we have to have this very conservative approach, that we have to do lots of testing before it works and all that. So where Red Hat is driving, and of course SAP and Sybase have been promoting, is how do we get to a consistency point where infrastructure that's going to be used to reduce latency get to the point where we can drive towards zero latency, how do we achieve that? This is where the collaborations really come into their own. Another good example I'll give you is questioning the convention. The convention typically is, once again, systems are record. You tend to have very structured, row-based stores, and you store information in these very nicely compartmentalized records. But the reality is that if you truly want to speed up the performance of an application, there are different approaches. One approach is taking a look at columnular-based databases. And Sybase in particular has been driving this and working with Red Hat for a number of years where we've produced some world-class benchmark results, TPCH-type benchmark results, where we wanted to strive towards more of an analytical runtime environment, a purposely built runtime environment. And Sybase has a world-leading product called Sybase IQ, which has had a lot of innovation and opportunity and working in strong collaboration with Red Hat on the definition of, of where we're taking the, from a platform perspective. So latency hotspots. We need to take a look at this and we need to address this from an end-to-end -end perspective. Now SAP has taken this at a literal point and said, well, if we wanted to look at the end-to-end -end data management requirements for managing big data, we have to look at it in these four dimensions. Number one, how do you ingest big data? Secondly, how do you store then process it? And then how do you eventually present that information? How do you visualize that information? So our intent has always been to provide a mechanism that goes end to end, but it's open to customer choice. It provides a mechanism where you're not driven by a particular stack and you must consume that stack in its full blown glory that may be given to you from Redwood Shores, or it could be given to you in a way that you can piecemeal put this thing together. That is the convention today. Many people want to have open and variety in choice. To put this together, from an SAP standpoint, we've taken a look at all the dimensions of latency. We've taken a look at it from the end-to-end -end management of big data. And from the ingestation all the way through to the presentation layer, we have a set of technologies that have been introduced to be able to deal with all of these different latent points. Just to pick out a couple of points here, from a mobile application standpoint, I'll start from top down, from, a, from an ingestation point of view and a presentation point of view. Presentation point of view, what you want to make sure is that you can have a consistency in application consumption. You want to be able to have that same data served up to you and be able to manage that information in a very simplified way. Now, SAP, of course, acquired Sybase. Sybase was revolutionizing the way that mobile applications get developed. One advent to that has been the development of the SAP NetWeaver Gateway. Gateway gives a consumption point. But what Sybase has also been developing is a mobile enterprise application platform. And this gives a capability where you can have a simplified experience on both the development and also on the management of the applications that are being pushed out to the edge. I'll give you one example in terms of the consistency part. In 2011, when Apple decided to port across the uh, Twitter application onto the iOS, one thing that they found out was that if you think of Android and you think of you know, all of the different platforms that are out there, although these platforms are somewhat standard, they're not standard because you have different device manufacturers that will always go through the evolution of supporting those applications across the various varieties and the, and the flavors of their operating systems. Now, Apple concluded that they needed approximately, or from an, from an Android perspective, there were approximately 250 versions of the Twitter application available for Android alone. So the consistency part is really important to make sure that you get. And from a mobile enterprise application point of view, what you can't tolerate is developing a single mobile application and then having to worry about all of these different form factors, all of these different operating system environments. So this is exactly where Sybase's innovations in mobile application development and then working much, much more closely post-acquisition with SAP on providing a consumable platform, a simplified platform to allow corporate enterprise data to be consumed by mobile developers. 
So at the top, we have the NetWeaver gateway, we have the Sybase Unwired platform. It's consumption and also development. Next, if you take a look at it from an analytical point of view, SAP has, of course, world-class business objects take capabilities. Great set of technologies and products for visualization. Well, let me start from the bottoms up now because there's another important distinction I want to make here. The world is exceedingly distributed. And in order to make data become available, what we have to understand is that information has to be delivered in real time. A great example is that if you think of data management, it's really been evolving towards distributed data management without our knowing. Think, the simple example I'll give you is mobile cellular phone that, that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. I live in London, I get on a plane, I come over across to Boston. The second I switch my cellular phone on, I expect to be able to make and receive phone calls. But the underlining data management and the distributed data management that's been used to achieve that is quite astounding. If you really look at it, look at it what's happened is that you have foreign entities, foreign you know, uh, carriers that you have effectively. In London, I may be on Vodafone. Whilst I'm roaming here in the US, I'm on, say, T-Mobile. So the ability for these carriers to interoperate with one another, these problems have been resolved. They've been resolved at a very low wire le data level to be able to provide real-time latency, low-level latency, before this interaction can take place. Just for, the, for you, if you're curious in terms of how the mobiles have got around this, they have very, very low latency data synchronization technologies. In London, using that telco example, there will be something called a host location register, which is effectively a subscription database. In that database, there will be a subscriber record for Irfan Khan. He has a cellular phone, happens to be on the Vodafone network, he has this call tariff, he has this package data tariff, whatever it might be. The moment I get onto the phone, or onto the plane rather, and I switch my cellular phone off, it tells the tower that I've now essentially terminated my network connection. It updates this record in the subscriber record that in the host location register. The moment that happens, now the database is in a consistent state. The moment I arrive in a foreign land, in the US, I switch on my cellular phone. The first thing that my phone does is it communicates with the cellular tower. The cellular tower tells it, you're now coming into the US, you don't have a subscription on the T-Mobile network, let us figure out if you have a roaming agreement with us. It sends across a request to pull across a subscription data from the home location register, a database, and it pulls it across and stores it into the visitor location register, a VLR, so an HLR to a VLR. The reason I'm giving you this little bit of detail is just to imply, this is still classic data infrastructure, database on one end, a database on the other end. But you have this almost instantaneous feed, low latency data distribution that's going on. Now we have this in certain industries, telco being one example. What SAP is striving towards is to have that same level of experience in ultra low latency, mechanisms to be able to do the consistency and the data distribution. So you're not just storing information, you're storing and then you're distributing that information. There's a mind shift that needs to take place to achieve that. So this is really what we're trying to strive towards from a big data perspective. Data is very distributed, and we need to provide that level of mechanism. Another key part is, is that we look at the storage and the processing of information. We need to enable much more real-time capabilities. The way that we achieve that is from an SAP point of view is we've made big investments in a real-time database platform, or real-time data platform, I should say. The real-time data requirements are driving the efficiencies of applications. You don't have to assume that data is gonna arrive at the end of the day because you happen to have a batch that arrives. We wanna to get to the point where we can achieve data distribution and of course data processing in a very efficient way. We're looking to collapse a lot of the layers, the complexity that exists in many landscapes, IT landscapes. One of the simplified ways of doing that is we look at the integration between OLTP environments and OLAP environments. We have a lot of legacy today that implies that you have to have a transactional operational system. Then we create either a virtualized data mart or a physical data mart where we then create cubes on top of. We then push data out to a, whether it's a, whether a front end to be able to materialize the data and then we visualize. At every single one of these hops, we incur more latency. So if we can do real-time reporting and we can also do real-time extreme OLTP within a single environment, that becomes a real-time data platform. This is a striving opportunity for us and for the industry to reconcile a lot of the IT investments that have been made in a non-disruptive way and allow a new class of application to come about which can truly become real-time. So if we look at this evolution, we're gonna start with an integration of both OLTP and, and analytics. We're gonna to strive towards having a real-time capability of, across big data. And then we're also getting it to the point where we can actually allow businesses to become real-time. So what does it actually mean? If a business becomes real time, what does it actually entitle that business to be able to do? Well, a picture tells a thousand words. If we really understand the opportunities of big data, 
I'll give you one simple example from, uh, once again, something which is quite, quite topical today, financial services again. In 2008, one of the reasons why the financial services market had such a big heartburn with dealing with this, uh, this level of data that was coming about and also the decision making that took place, because the market has shifted from having traditional uh, buy side and sell side activities in trading to more algorithmic black box trading. So in order to create an algorithmic trading model, what happens is that you have these very experienced and very uh, technically minded mathematicians, algorithmic traders or quants, who create these very tight, efficient algorithms. And those algorithms are effectively modeled in such a way where you can take a look at the model in isolation and assume that any inputs that are coming in, let us assume that Red Hat stock is trading high, you may want to sell something else because you can buy more Red Hat, Red Hat shares from an equities point of view. The reality is that what has happened over time is that these models, these financial models that were created, were looking at a very small window of data. Because that small window existed, they weren't really able to do backtesting. So the intent is to provide the ability to do much more backtesting across much larger data sets. So therefore, the algorithmic trading models of the future will be that much more efficient. Another good example is predicting the future. This picture tells a thousand words again. If you've ever been to India, crossing the road is, is in itself is an ordeal. You don't want to be dealing with information that's one minute old, five minutes old, or even 10 minutes old. This guy here is going to end up in a horizontal position if he's not careful. So you have to be able to look at predicting the future outcomes. Businesses need that, and we're assuming that we're going to get to that point in time. So let me just sum up here and talk about the enterprise of tomorrow. From an SAP point of view, working with our strategic partners, Red Hat, what we're proposing is freedom to innovate new applications, to have transparency across all application classes, to have a new runtime environment that's be it across a standardized on-premise platform, across a hybrid platform which may go on-premise and on-demand, on and also extending to on-device. We're driving towards innovations in memory because we believe that we can get away from this pre-aggregation of data that really does not prevent allows opportunities, I should say, for the real-time capabilities. We have uh, some information that you can read here, and you can also come by the booth and get more information. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.